Hello everyone. So this was this is going to be a fairly interesting review for me. Um, this is a book that I've been wanting to get around to for a while. I read it quite a long time ago. Um, I was planning to do a very big in-depth review. However, that's probably not going to happen. I read it a long time ago, and I'll say that um, this book, the, these two books, I'm going to be reviewing: Mythagal Wood and Levondis, um are extremely complicated. Now. I will say that people have these ideas of what complicated literary books are, these intelligent books. I'll say that Mythagord and Levondist, I, prob I probably struggled reading Levondist, the second book, more than any intelligent literary book that I've read. Chekhov, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Wolf, any of those authors. I find, I find it fascinating. These are just, they look like sort of generic um, fantasy books, I suppose, um, with sort of nature elements and maybe mythic elements. They don't really strike you as being extremely complicated, but we will get, we will get into that. Um, the literary criticism and the significance of this of these books is very in depth. You got a lot of it's going to be a quote heavy review. A lot of people talking about mythogenic processes, chthonic abyssal entities, and all this sort of stuff. Um, we'll get into that. There's a lot, a lot to cover. But um, so I'll, I'll briefly start off by saying that Robert Holstock is a seems like a kindred spirit. He actually he passed away a couple of years ago. Um, Robert Holstock had a. He's from England. Um, he had a master's degree in zoology, I believe. I have a BSc in um, undergraduate in ecology, and he's very much interested in nature and myth and history, very much uh, as I am, I suppose. Now, there's so much to cover here that I'll just I'll just start off with um, re reading the back of the book. And something I noticed actually, this is my second take because this threw me off a little bit. I don't I don't really have the best um, impression of Golang's books. I realised I was just I probably never noticed this at the time. But they've called the brother in the story, the brother of Stephen Huxley, Christopher Huxley. Um, it's actually Christian, I'm not quite sure what the... I think that's the second book, maybe the third, third book in the Fantasy Masterworks Golang series that have had a strange back blurb. Anyway. Deep within the wildwood lies a place of myth and mystery from which few return and of those few none remain unchanged. Stephen Huxley has already lost his father to the mysteries of Rye Hope Wood. On his return from the Second World War, he finds his brother, Christian, not Christopher, is also enthralled to the mysterious Wildwood, wherein lies a realm where mythic archetypes grow flesh and blood, where love and beauty haunt your dreams, and in promises of freedom lies the sanctuary of insanity. It's an interesting, it's not quite how I um, recognise the book plot, but um, anyway. So this is a, a fairly big book in terms, it's it's obscure in the in the fantasy sort of oeuvre, but it's, it's, it's there's an introduction by Neil Gaiman, Michael Moorcock has a blurb, um, Peter F. Hamilton has a blurb as well. It's, he's, he's, a lit, he's a sort of literary um, underground type writer. So in order to give myself a sort of a, a, a basis and a background for these two books, which again are extremely complicated, more so than anything, I mean, the other side, just as a comparison, the other side is complicated in that it's it's traditionally literary and it has these allegor allegorical themes and symbolism and it's just weird for weirdness sake I suppose but these books are like it's I have to say I'm just going to put this out there you probably, probably hate me for saying this but it's sort of like the intelligent person's Brandon Sanderson um, it's, it's world building to the extreme but it's extremely literary it's extremely um I'll read the first paragraph of this um, introduction. Mythagal Wood is a fantasy novel written by British writer Robert Holdstock. It served as the first in a series of novels known as the Mythagal Wood or Rye Hope Wood cycle. It belongs to a type of fantasy literature known as mythic fiction. It has received critical acclaim for the quality of its prose, its forest setting and its exploration of philosophical, spiritual and psychological themes. Within the, within the fantasy genre, Mythagal Wood has drawn critical attention for a vi variety of reasons over a span of years. 
Orson Scott Card described it as, for readers who are willing to take the time and effort to let a writer evoke a whole and believable world, peopled with living characters. People go on to say that it um, stands apart from genre, fantasy, whatever that means. The, sen- uh, the sequence as a whole is a central contribution to the late 20th century fantasy. Um, depth and breadth of imagination in some respects surpasses Tolkien. I would say that's true. It makes Tolkien look simplified. Not in the summer, not in terms of the Summerlian, but Lord of the Rings, perhaps. So here's I'm just gonna I'm gonna I'm throwing out these passages and terms just to give you a, a quick idea in case you don't believe me that this is a complicated work. The forest is ref- referred to by John Clute, who I believe is a a prominent uh, critic, I think, um, or essayist. The forest is referred to John by John Clute as an abyssal chthonic resonator because it creates and is home to myth images or mythagos, who are creatures, including animals, monsters, and humans, uh, generated from the ancient from ancient memories and myths within the subconscious of nearby human minds. The book itself defines a mythago as a myth imago. Uh, imago is um, a stage in sort of butterflies' life cycle. A myth imago, the image of the idealised form of a myth creature. Mythagos are dangerously real, but if any of them stray too far from the wood, they slowly deteriorate and die. So this book is all about mythogenic processes, hollows, vortexes, um, mapping out locations where these myth images come to life and and breed in... um, it's all to do with the collective unconscious. It's to do with um, human interaction with folklore. It's ex- it's quite complicated. Uh, but before we take it back to the more human element and discuss the characters, something I actually forgot in my I, this is my second attempt at the review. Um, I was fascinated by this book because it's um, very much interested in other worlds and thresholds, uh, which which these books discuss in quite a lot of depth and. The themes of nature and myth and history. Um, I actually I attempted a a, no, a novella recently. Um, I think it came to about seventy k words. It's very much inspired by Mathago Wood. Very much so. There's actually a character a character called Robert in it. Who wasn't who wasn't called Robert because of Robert Holdstock, but I just f- found it was a nice element, um, a nice connection. And it even starts in a sort of uh, the the beginning starts in a house. Uh, there are two brothers. It, it's very much inspired by Mythago Wood. Now, speaking of these two brothers, there's uh, Stephen Huxley and uh, Christian Huxley, not Christopher, as the book, the back of the blurb likes to say. Stephen Huxley has come back from the war, and he, um, Second World War, um, and he's staying with his brother, uh, Christian Huxley, and slowly over time, this this it's like a little cottage that they used to they used to grow up in, I grew up around, and, and there's the Ryholt Wood surrounds the cottage. Um, slowly over time, Stephen realizes that things aren't as they were when he left for the war. Um, strange happenings in Ryholt Wood. Their father has actually died, George Huxley, who uh who is deeply obsessed and connected with Ryhope Wood. He has his journal. Uh, some of the best parts of the book are to do with George's, um, George Huxley's research, his sort of jottings and his maps about the various places in the wood. We, we slowly come to terms with the fact that Ryhope Wood and its surroundings are not, it's not just a regular wood. It's, yeah, it's a sort of vortex, a sort of... Um, it's a home for mythagos, these 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 beings that are spawned by the human imagination, I suppose, within the wood itself. And and the wood is much faster than it appears to be. Um, so that's really where things start off with, and we learn that um, not just George Huxley, but um, Stephen's brother Christian has connections with a woman from the wood called Gwyneth. It's actually pronounced. It's it's spelt Gwyneth, um, sort of Celtic name, but it's pronounced in the story as uh, Stephen knows her as Gwyneth, I believe. That's how you pronounce it. Um, 
who is a sort of tribal mythical figure. Um, so I should say all of these characters, all the mythagos are, they come from the Neolithic, the sort of Stone Age. They are there's there's mentions of Arthurian characters. It's it's a mishmash of different archetypes and, and characters and heroes from history and mythology, and legend and folklore. So the story really, again, I'm really going to be touching on just the, the very basics of the story um, from Mythago Wood. It's essentially it's about Stephen's journey into the wood and his connection with Gwyneth. Um So I'll say that Christian eventually leaves to go into the wood, and that's sort of the the sort of inciting incident, I suppose, for for uh, Stephen to go into the wood. And he also meets uh, Twinif as well. So, and that's how that's how things go from the real, the real world into Mythagal Wood, I suppose, Rival Wood. Um, and a, a part that I just found fascinating, really engaging, is uh, Stephen's use of his father's notes and research and maps to figure out where he is going in in the wood. And he gets disorientated, and there's different thresholds, and he and he finds himself circling back around, and he he sits in a tent and just watches for Mythagos coming out, and all sorts of stuff. It's it's really good. I really like the sort of start section. From there, it, boy, does it get complicated. Um, once we get into the wood, I'll say, obviously, we're going to be dealing with Mythagos. We have um, little pockets of. How do I describe this? We have pockets of, I say they're almost like little hotspots or islands of creation. So actually, this is again it, it links back to my own novella that I attempted, where if within this wood there are, so for example, they'll they'll just be journeying and they'll just see a castle just appear in the wood, or they'll be hunters from the Neolithic or whatever. There are there are all these different strange there are tribes like the life speakers and, um. It gets very layered quite quickly. Um, different blendings of myths and stories and memories, the subconscious. Um, and, I mean, they even meet people that are connected with Robin Hood and knights and all these different various shamanic characters. Um, one of the things I will say is that um, very quickly, very early on, we'll get these stories within stories. Now, I don't I'm not going to pretend that I enjoyed those stories within stories. Uh, if you like metafiction, if that's the right word, you might enjoy this book. But for me, it just got a little bit too complicated. And I'm not the only one. I'll be reading reviews in this... Uh, so, yeah, I'll be reading reviews in this review. People struggled with this, especially in Levondis, the second book. Um, there are these stories told by the Mythagos that that are sort of um, nested, um, it's like Inception, there are stories within stories, but the problem is there will be names that change over time and gradually develop. This is a, this is a writer's book, it's all about um, the development of, the development of myth. It's all, it's all about the development of story and how, and how story changes from person to person. It's really quite, it's impressive. I can't pretend to understand all of it at all, and it was a while ago that I read it, and things have just gone out of, the, out of my head, really. It's definitely about these mythogenic processes. There's various, there's various plot elements. There's, there's actually a creature called the Urskemug, I believe that's how you pronounce it, um, who may or may not have connections with um, Stephen and Christian. Uh, which is a sort of boar figure. This it's we learn that he's the first sort of heroic archetype, and there's, but it might have some Freudian elements as well. There's a whole bunch of stuff here, as you can you can probably tell by now. There's a lot of stuff here. And where where this eventually leads is that, obviously the characters become more embroiled in Mythagal Wood, and they may. Go from the human to the more archetypal. I'll leave it at that. So there's a lot here. There's a lot here. So in terms of the prose, just to summarise this, obviously it's already a fairly long in, uh, review and I've got Levantis to describe as well, just quickly. I'd say for the prose, incredible world building, some of the most in-depth, it can be a, a little bit convoluted at times, but incredible world building, especially at the start. 
again the start is brilliant um, very much an inspiration for my own stuff good detail a lot of exploration and research um, there's a, there's various things um, I mean it's a fairly lengthy book it's well, not, it's a sort of standard, I suppose, but it's about three hundred ish. Um, so we'll get we'll get Stephen going to his, um, relatives and, and people that are connected with George, and uh, there there are scientists like um, I, I believe it's Alfred Wynne Jones, and there's people like Harry Keaton, an RAF pilot who helps uh, uh, Stephen survey the woods from above. Um, there's a, there's a lot of stuff here, so there's a lot of good exploration and research. Again, feeling of I've, I've written here the feeling of exploring the surroundings and trying to penetrate the wood, and get further in and uh, explore this sort of mythological landscape, and the history behind the wood as well. Um, we'll get flashbacks. Um, for example, uh, Stephen and Christian saw a mythago as a child, uh, as children, um, and they, of course they didn't realize that it was a mythago at the time. This sort of um, woodsman type character I believe so really good on, on those fronts in terms of the cons though I'm going to have to say you'll probably not be surprised by this it's probably complicated to the point of extreme confusion um, even if you've read all these fantasy books the, the big sagas and all that sort of stuff it's, I'd say it's quite complicated mostly to do with the meta stories the stories within stories get quite complicated and how that tracks the development of names and whatnot. So I think the the end was a little bit rushed as well, maybe a little bit disparate in terms of um, where the characters are. There's this whole thing to do with Levondis, I'll come to that, but the end deals with a place called Levondis, this sort of mythological threshold, this wall of fire, there's a whole, all these different symboli symb symbolic uh, elements to the story. And a lot, once, I, once I got to that part, I just felt like I didn't quite grasp where the story was going. Um, maybe that's my fault. Um, and I, I guess just to bring it back to the more human element as well, I, this is a novel of ideas I'd say. The characters aren't too strong. The central premise of Twyneth, um, there's a sort of romantic relationship, sort of like a triangle between Christian and Stephen and George. Um, I don't think that was very realistic and it sort of falls flat for me. Um, and also Harry Keaton, this RAF pilot, unfortunately I'd say that his character is not developed at all. Um, it's a very it's a strange one that I will come to that in the Bondus though. So that was Mythago Wood. Hopefully you can see that um, really quite quite a complicated work there. I, I'll, I'll just I'll I'll end by reading this little quote here. This may be a little bit pompous. It's for you to decide. The story is also considered an inward spiral in which the protagonists undergo cruel and de uh, devastating metamorph metamorphoses in a difficult setting. Difficult indeed. Brian Aldiss has written that Ryhope Wood is that terrifying metaphor for our mental labyrinths in which phylogeny pres presides over ontogeny with regard to an individual's history and destiny. Okay, so. There's my Thago Wood. So. All these buzzwords, all these terms, um, probably got the idea by now that it's fairly complicated. I even feel silly saying that sometimes. Don't know that how much depth and detail goes into these literary books, but I'm I'm not one of these people that say that just because it's fantasy, it can't be complicated. It can't be worthy of your time and effort. Now, Levondis is a whole other thing. Unfortunately, this book. This one just, unfortunately, it's complicated, but so much so that you feel that you just got Robert got way too far ahead of himself, just lost these different threads and the plot elements. There are reviews here that agree that it's very convoluted and confusing. So of course, this book is the second book in the series. Um, it doesn't. It, there will be spoilers in a sense. I'm going to try and keep it vague. The the main characters of uh, Christian and Stephen, Stephen and Christian, aren't prominent in the book at all, really. So it's sort of a disconnected um, from sort of disconnected from Mythago Wood, but of course it it's develops the, the lore and the world building. So I'm just going to read the um, back of the book. 
when Harry Keaton disappeared into Ryhope Wood, of course Harry Keaton, the RAF pilot from book one, his sister Talis was just an infant. Now 13 years old, she hears him whispering to her from the other world. He is in danger. He needs her help. Using masks, magic and clues left by her grandfather, she finds a way to enter the primitive forest and begin her quest. Eventually she comes to Levondis itself, a realm both beautiful and deadly, a place in which she is changed forever. So, this book is from Talis's point of view. It develops the world building and the uh, structure of how the Mythagos work and how the, the woods work quite significantly. There are two elements that are added here that I felt kind of unfortunate. It just seems to be slightly contradictory to how the original... It started off being quite straightforward in the sense that you enter this wood, which is a sort of um, breeding ground for Mythagos, and it contains these different archetypes and myths and, and images, but then we have masks and hollows and these other different... It starts dealing with time and um, different loops and whatnot. It gets very complicated. Um, the central premise of this book is that Talis, this 13-year-old, uh, this young woman, is trying to find her brother, her older brother, um, uh, Keaton, who, of course, went away with... Um, went away with Stephen into the into Ryhope Wood. But before she can do that, she has this... Um, these dealings with these Mythagos um, who are trying to initiate her, I suppose. It's so, sort of like a shamanic um, induction, I suppose. So there are these masks that uh, Talus creates in order to see um, hollows, which are sort of like pathways or gateways into the wood so it's not where's where's book one it was just Ryhope Wood and we enter Ryhope Wood there are these almost gaps in the sort of fabric of the world where you can enter um, a sort of mythogenic landscape I suppose is how, I could, how you could say that there are these hollows and there are these Mythagos I believe that are trying to contact and initiate um, Talus into this sort of into her quest and I'm I'm going to say I don't pretend to understand these the elements in this book, and it's been quite a while. So she creates these masks that that are supposed to stand in for some of the first um, Mythagos, I suppose, the first legend. So we'll have, for example, the Hollower, which is a mask that she creates from Elm, uh, a female mask painted red and white. It's all this symbolism and, Im and imagery, of course. There's Gabor Lungi made from oak. Uh, this mask is known as the memory of the land. Skogin, the shadow of the forest. Volcano, sort of bird-like mask image. The flight of a bird into an unknown region. It's very much, it feels shamanic. This book is, it's much more, I mean, I'm inclined to say it's almost esoteric in a way. The flight of a bird into the unknown region, the memory of the land. Lament, made from willow bark. <coughs> so before she goes into um, the mythogenic landscape, into Mythagal Wood, um, she meets, interestingly, she meets a, there's a cameo from Ralph Vaughan Williams, the composer, which I believe uh, was one of Robert Holdstock's favourite. Okay, so I'm fairly struggling to summarise this book. Uh, a couple of attempts here. I'll summarise by saying that this book... Um, it deals with Talis's creation of these masks and she tries to understand these hollows and these mythagos that are reaching out to her. So she, she has this creative element where she creates the masks to see the hollows and she eventually, she actually, it's not really a spoiler to say, she actually meets Ralph Vaughan Williams, the composer, the real Ralph Vaughan Williams. I believe that was one of her, or possibly the, uh, Robert Holdstock's favourite composer, just a little cameo. And so he's really the only one that understands what she's going through, This these strange sightings. Obviously, there are two creative characters. One's a musician, one is a sculptor who's creating these masks. Um, she's trying to figure out the notes that her grandfather left her and, and where Harry Keaton went, her brother. And um, eventually, she reaches inside this hollow 
I believe it's in a field, um, she's looking out over this oak tree and she sees Skathak, who is a, a warrior. I believe, if I remember from Arthurian legend, he's the one that actually kills Arthur, I believe. I should, I believe he's mentioned in the Mabinogion just briefly, I think. Suffice it to say, there's a sort of romantic element to that. And she changes Skathak's role in the mythology, and there's a connection there. Eventually, she's led by this um, stag called the Broken Boy, who um, who has this another mythological role. And eventually, she she le she goes into um, the wood and she grows up. And then from there, again, so I'll keep trying to keep it vague. This is really I'm talking about one percent of the book, really. Um, from there, we actually meet the character of Win Jones. Um, I believe it's Alfred Win Jones. I don't have the name at hand. It's Win Jones either way. Um, a sci the scientist who first went into Mythical Wood with George Huxley. So George Huxley was the first scientist, the the father of Christian and Stephen. Um, so Win Jones has become initiated into Mythical Wood, um, and he is. He he's entered a sort of Neolithic settlement, so he he has all this knowledge and he's almost a shamanic figure himself. And we learn about where he went and so so obviously from from book one he was just this a name, but now we learn, um, we learn more about him. And so, to summarize, I think where this book ends up is it's almost surreal. Um, there there are all these characters that I could I could try and plot there like Harry Key and where he goes and his connection with a city and there's all, all sorts of stuff as you can imagine um, interestingly though this book deals with time loops and birth and rebirth uh, one of the characters actually ends up being um, almost integrated into nature and sees seasons passing and so one of the things I forgot to mention is that um, this is a Fairly, I'm jumping all over the place here. Um, Levondis. Levondis is a kind of a sort of, sort of like a singular point in this mythogenic landscape. So there's a wall of fire that we learn in, in this, at the end of book one, and then that actually leads to this primal, primordial landscape of the Ice Age. Um, it's interesting. The the first book. Is, it ends in Levondis, and you think the second book called Levondis, you'd think that would um, go from Levondis from the very beginning to the end. But it's only actually, it's surprising, it's only at the end of this book called Levondis that we actually really get to know what Levondis is. So you're really waiting a long time. Essentially, almost two books, really. Um, it's the last quarter of the last second book. And there are all these different things here. So. I'm struggling to connect all the elements. There's masks and hollows and time warps and there's a there's a family. So it goes from goes from Talis to then we, we'll get Win Jones's perspective and then we'll get these different stories within stories, um, and we'll, we'll have this a whole section where there's just a family, who a sort of Ice Age family that's connected with I believe it's a raven, and how that and then there's. If so, I think you can you can gather here that I'm struggling to connect all the elements. I'm, I'm going to end by reading these quotes. Now, this might justify this. This probably justify why I'm struggling with the with Levondis. I found I found Levondis interesting but very difficult reading. Many ideas were not presented with clarity and directness, and the plot develops too slowly. In the month it took me f for me to read this book, this isn't this is a, a quote from online. I forgot many I've, many of the ideas and much of the mood which holds stock so painfully developed. Another review. Secondly, Levondis made me think. It was complex and convoluted, and I didn't even know how complex it was until I got to the end. My brain had trouble bringing it all together in the end. What exactly is Levondis? Why do the Mythagos travel there? What drove Harry into the forest? Who is he there? How is he related to the Mythagos? There's a lot here, there's quotes here, superbly deranging and intense, metamorphic terrain of daunting rigour, and an, ex an excremental, sign-saturated inscape charged with twisting energy. I'm quite happy that quote exists there because it, 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 
it captures my sort of struggle to understand this book. And yes, whilst I do enjoy Robert Holstock's stories set in Mythagal Wood and Ryhope Wood, at times they're brutally scientific to the point of inducing nausea of far too many terms and explanations. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, Mythagal Wood and Levondis. If you want a challenge, here's two books for you to read. There's a lot more actually, I believe there's seven or eight books I couldn't stomach anymore unfortunately. Um, I can't imagine myself going back to these. The amount of things you have to keep in your head for this. Oh, I just could not imagine reading book three. There's various prequels and all sorts, but uh, I commend Robert Holstock for this, for these books. I just could not. Mythical Wood, I'd recommend. Levondis is complicated. So there, I finally got around to it. It's a quite a long review. Probably the editing's probably off the charts with just how. Um, fragmented and clumsy it's going to be but there you go some methago wood hope you enjoyed the review see you later cheers <laughs>